Rabbi Arthur Green in conversation with Professor and former Chancellor Arnold Eisen on the topic of Judaism for the world and neo-Hasidic perspective. Uh, the annual um, Cohen Lecture was established in 1993 by the late Honorable Howard M. Holtzman, who was Honorary Chairman of the JTS Board of Trustees as a tribute to the late Gerson Cohen, uh, who was an acclaimed scholar of Jewish history and an inspiring leader who served as JTS Chancellor from 1972 to 1986. Uh, tonight's program is inspired by Rabbi Green's masterful new book, Judaism for the World, Reflections on God, Life, and Love. And we will be posting a link to the book in the chat a few minutes after the, uh, the formal program begins. Um, so I wanted to just give you a rundown of how, uh, how the program will be going this evening, our format will be treated to two rounds of conversation with uh, professors Green and Eisen. And after each round, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A from all of you. To ask a question, we're going to use the chat feature for that. So you should send questions to me, Rabbi Julia Andelman, um, via the chat. And when we get to those two Q&A periods, I will select a few of the questions to present and uh, we uh, we'll almost definitely not get to all of them, so apologies for that, but please do send me your questions um, as they occur to you. We don't have an open chat tonight. You can just um, chat with me um, and also with my colleague, Rabbi Tim Bernard, Director of Digital Learning at JTS. Uh, his screen name is JTS on uh, Online Programs, I believe. So questions for our speakers should go to me and questions of a technical nature can send to um, via the chat to JTS online programs. Um, okay, on that note, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Eitan Fishbane, Associate Professor of Jewish Thought at JTS to introduce tonight's presenters. And we've asked Professor Fishbane to introduce our speakers because he is uh, the student of Professor Green. Dr. Fishbane. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman, and um, it it is uh, it is a, a special a special honor to um, uh, to be able to and a great privilege to be able to uh, to introduce tonight's speakers and uh, with a lot of um, a lot of warmth and gratitude to my teacher of many years, uh, Rabbi Professor uh, uh, Art Green, Arthur Green, um, and um, um, and then also. Uh, also uh, get to Professor Eisen, but uh, but also uh, also a real a real delight as we as we transition from you being ch uh, chancellor to being a Jewish thought colleague. So it's uh, that's also wonderful. Um, so Rabbi Professor Arthur Green, um, a scholar of worldwide renown, was the founding dean and is currently rector of the Rabbinical School and Irving Brudnick Professor of Jewish Philosophy and Religion at Hebrew College in Boston. He is Professor Emeritus at Brandeis University, where he occupied the distinguished uh, Philip W. Lown Professorship in Jewish Thought, and uh, also where, um, where I had the, uh, the great personal pleasure to, uh, to learn from him and to first, uh, to first study Jewish mysticism uh, with him many years, uh, many years ago. Um, both, uh, both, a, both an historian of Jewish religion and a theologian, uh, his work seeks to form a bridge between these two distinct fields of endeavor. He was educated at Brandeis, where he earned his PhD, and at JTS, where he received rabbinic ordination. Dr. Green has taught Jewish mysticism, Hasidism, and theology at a number of prominent colleges and universities and has lectured widely throughout the Jewish community in North America and Israel. Founder of Chavurat Shalom in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, he remains a leading independent figure in the Jewish renewal movement. A prolific author, his masterful new book is Judaism for the World, Reflections on God, Life, and Love. 
Professor Arnold M. Eisen, one of the world's foremost authorities on American Judaism, is Chancellor Emeritus of the Jewish Theological Seminary, JTS, and Professor of Jewish Thought. Uh, Professor Eisen became Chancellor in 2007 and stepped down in, um, to, uh, in 2020 to return to teaching and scholarship as a full-time member of uh, the JTS faculty. As Chancellor, he transformed the education of religious, pedagogical, professional, and lay leaders for North American Jewry. Um, I am I'm now uh, greatly pleased to turn the program over to Professor Eisen for uh, what I know will be a most uh, illuminating conversation with, um, with Rabbi Professor Green. Thanks, Eitan. I can say with confidence that we're all in for a treat this evening. And for me personally, it's a treat to have a conversation with my friend Art. We've been friends for something like 35 years now. I don't remember the exact first meeting, but it's, it's in that range. And I, yet I can say that I learned things about Art's thinking from this new book that I had not known before. And I learned a lot about Art's life that I had not known before. It's a very personal book. It's a book dedicated, quote, to my, my Chavirim in Chavirat Shalom. There are frequent references to Art's late wife, Kathy, who was a good friend to many of us who passed away in 2017. There is frank discussion of the impact of the death of Art's mother had on his teenage years and on his life beyond that. And Art says on the very first page of the preface, quote, I'm an old guy now. The roots of my own journey go back even farther than the late 60s, when spiritual quest first began to appear on the radar screen of an entire generation. So Art, I thought we could begin on this personal level with some reflections about what you call your earthly spiritual journey, which of course included, I say this because of the audience we have this evening, Camp Ramah, uh, Brandeis, um, JTS, Chavarat Shalom and, and a set of other stations in between. So tell us a little bit about your life that you want to recall at this point on the journey. All of the above, all of the above, Arne. Yes, it's great to be here with you. And uh, hello to lots of familiar names and old friends whom I see are, uh, are, are on the list. Great to, great to see everyone. Um, yes, I, the journey is long and complicated and not easy to talk about in a few words. I'm an American Jew, third generation. My parents were born in America just after their parents' immigration early in the 20th century. I grew up in a militantly atheist household. My dad was very proud of the fact that his people were already liberated from that nonsense called religion and wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and I, for some unknown reason, you may explain it either psychologically or spiritually, by age eight or seven or eight, I was attracted somehow to Judaism, to my mother's parents' Judaism. They were old world Jews, not Orthodox, but, but traditionalist. I was attracted to their Judaism. I remember schlepping my mother to synagogue on Friday nights and whether she came with me because she wanted to get away from the, my father's Friday night bridge game or whether she had some interest in being in shul herself, I'm not sure. But we went to hear Joachim Prince give brilliant lectures in Newark, New Jersey. That was our, that was our synagogue, Prince's Temple. And then I was attracted to my grandparents' shul. Um, um, after my mother died, I became very close to my grandparents. What happened was uh, she passed away when I was 11 and two years later, her only brother died and my grandparents were totally devastated. And I was the, I was the anical. I was the grandson who was interested in Yiddishkeit, who wanted to learn to speak Yiddish with them, who wanted to go to school with them. So I was, I was sent to spend a lot of time with them. So I was half raised by people a generation above. I, I was half raised by my father and in some ways half raised by my mother's parents. And I was pulled into Judaism very strongly. When I was 13, I discovered this marvelous book called The Code of Jewish Law, the Kitzur Shulchanara, and tried to observe as much as I possibly could in my father's strictly trafe household. And, um, and uh, I, I, I spent a few summers at Ramah. I should have opened by saying how happy I am to be delivering this talk because Gerson Cohen was my teacher in Ramah the summer when I was either 15 or 16 and learned a lot from him. We just studied Ezra Nehemiah with him, I remember. And um, 
And uh, Rama had a great influence on me, no question about that, and created lots of tension between me and my dad. And we fought all our adolescent battles uh, over religion. I got to Brandeis when I was 16 years old. I was a very young freshman. And within two years, I walked away from religion completely. I decided it was all a bunch of nonsense. And I'd been kidding myself and hiding behind, hiding behind the mask of, of religiosity because I couldn't deal with, with loss. And uh, I set on my course to become a secular Jew. Um, a secular Jew, well, how do you become a secular Jew? I discovered both Zionism and Yiddishism. I was in love with Yiddish as well as Hebrew. So I used to, I was head of the Student Zionist Organization. I used to go to lectures at the Yiddish Kultur Club in Boston and bring down the average age in the room by about 60 years. And um, it took me about two years to say, no, no, that's not what it's about. Uh, yes, I no longer believe what I believed before, but I'm a seeker. I'm, I'm in this business to find out why I'm alive and why I'm mortal and what this life is about, and what I'm supposed to be doing here. It's not about culture and, and national identity. It's about, it's about the ultimate questions. Now then I have the very great blessing of two mentors. Alex, Professor Alexander Altman had just come from England. And in 1960, he taught the first class on Jewish mysticism ever taught in an American university. And I was a student in the class. By the way, I, my friend Daniel Matt took that same course with Altman 10 years later. Um, so we're, we are all, all, of, all of us who study Kabbalah in this country are Altman students in one way or another. I'd also met Zalman Schechter by then. And he was an important mentor. He was just in his, in his own journey away from Chabad and looking to create some kind of neo hasidism One of them, one of the two of them, I don't remember which, probably Zalman, but I'm not sure, when I was 20 years old, gave me an essay to read by Hillel Zeitlin, a famous neo hasidic figure who'd been killed on the, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, Zeitlin wrote a little essay called Yisodota Hasidut, The Fundaments of Hasidism. In my Hebrew was, I was comfortable with Hebrew already at that point. And, um, and I read that essay and I said, this is it. This will be my religious language for the rest of my life. And I'm gonna translate this essay into English. And this is, my, this is my new Judaism. It somehow, I felt it echoed into some deep echo chamber within me. It felt like he was speaking the truth. It was a very different kind of Judaism than anything I'd seen before. And indeed I translated, it took me 50 years but I published a book of his writings in English. And after that year, that was my senior year in college, I went off to Jerusalem and studied, I sat in Gershom Sholem's lectures and did a, did a study group in Zohar with Rivka Schatz and then came to JTS. I came to JTS mostly to gain the tech skills I would need for studying Kabbalah. I was not too much interested in being a rabbi at that point, but that was the place, that was the place of course for serious study of Hebrew text. And um, after a year when I was talking about leaving, uh, Seymour Siegel was my Talmud teacher, came up to me and said, would you stay if you had a private program of study with Professor Heschel? And I said, yes, that was a great privilege. And I was Heschel's private student for the next four years. And that was indeed one of the very great intellectual privileges of my life. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop that one there. <laughs> and today we're celebrating, we're marking Heschel's birthday in the English calendar, January the 11th. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, very good. All right. So the book is sort of accounting. I mean, it's like, okay, I want to share with you some of the things I've learned because they may be of, of use to you. And in particular, what I'd like you to address as well is what have you said in this book that you haven't said before, or haven't said quite in this way before? So that I had the impression as I was reading this, as I said, I was learning things all the time and I've read a lot of your books. Mm -hmm. So maybe share with, with the group here some of what, what you've come to see in the last few years that you're sharing now that you haven't shared before. So in this journey that began in the JTS years, by the way, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was applying to JTS, uh, I was living in Israel for the year and I really wasn't being very observant that year. And um, JTS of course required a pledge. You would keep Shabbat and Kashrut and daily prayers. And I didn't know quite what to do. So I wrote to two rabbis who were mentors of mine um, to ask them what to do. Stephen Schwarzschild and Joe Lukinski, for those who know those names. They both said, you must apply to, you must go to JTS and just lie on the, lie on the, lie on the pledge, it's all right. And Lukinski said to me, besides, if you go to HUC, I'll kick your teeth in. And Lukinski was a tough guy. So I had to go to JTS and it was the right decision, of course. 
Um, but coming back to a full life of observance was a very long journey for me. Um, because I'd had a I'd had a I'd had a bad version of it as a, as a as as a kind of neurotically from adolescent, neurotically pious adolescent. It took me a very long time to be comfortable with it. When I turned, oh, somewhere between 65 and 70, I looked at myself and I said, but this is the way I want to live. This is the way I like living. And I just walked into a kind of uh, a kind of uh, very traditional, uh, full, 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 full set of religious observance and feel very comfortable with about it, about it, but I've had to explain it to myself. So there are two essays in this book. One is called How I Practice Judaism. And it sort of explains why I'm an observant Jew, even though I'm not a literal believer, of course, in the old, in the old sense, in, in almost any of it. Um, I still have found my way back to a very, a very full kind of traditional observance. And then the essay after that is How I Pray. And that's an essay that I originally published in Hebrew. When the Hebrew edition of Radical Judaism came out, I added that chapter to it. Because many readers, readers of Radical Judaism ask me, well, how can you dive into a God like that if you're talking about God as the oneness of being and we are all part of God um, and God isn't somebody out there with whom you're having a dialogue or conversation. I'm a, I'm a mystic, not a Buberian in that sense. Um, I'm quite far from Levinas, for example, who insists on the absoluteness of the other. Uh, Zeitlin from coming from the other side of the European continent is saying, no, no, that's only tentative. But ultimately, we are all one. But if we're all one in God, and there is no other, then what does it mean to pray? So I wrote, it, I wrote that essay on, um, on called How I Pray. And that's a very important and very personal piece. That essay in turn is an introduction to my next project. I've just completed, probably for 20 or 25 years, I've been writing down comments on the sitter as I daven. And I've just completed a commentary on the prayer book. And I hope that will come out in the next couple of years. And uh, in some ways, the commentary, it's called, it's called Be'er L'chai Roi, and that commentary is a bridge between what I mean by the words and what the words in the book are saying, and how can a person like me possibly be using those very traditional words of prayer, which I do every day. And, uh, and so that, uh, that link has been a very important piece of what I've been doing. So that was a very important section for me personally to read. I think that all of us, who find our place inside the tradition and inside the traditional liturgy, especially, come to terms with it. I, I, I've used the metaphor, others have as well, of wearing stereo headphones that you, in, in one ear, you have the, the words that are on the page, and in the other ear, you have the meanings that you have accumulated over the years mm -hmm. for those words. And the, there's not only a beautiful chapter in this book called How I Pray, there's also, it's followed up by a chapter called Baruch Ata, where you, you hit that the central, the central problem here. How is it that I can say Baruch Atah? Right. Atah is the hardest word. And how can I not say it? Is, is what he read, right? Mm -hmm. And so can you expand a little bit about that? How do, how do we take the one? You don't like the term God a lot. And maybe you could talk a little about why you don't much care for the term God. And then you prefer things like the one. But how do I say Baruch Atah to the one if I don't quite know if there's a one listening when I say Baruch Atah? Uh, listening is not the question. I say in that same chapter, I have a little section called What Prayer Is Not. And I tell the story of the Chassid in Grand Central Station. He's dashing through Grand Central Station around 6 p.m. and he suddenly realizes he hasn't Davin Mincha. And he's a little embarrassed just to stand there and, and shuckle away in Davin Mincha. So he looks around, he sees lots of people have phones in their hands and they're talking. So he picks up his phone, puts it to his ear, and says, Asher Shri Secha, and begins to Davin. And who's gonna know? I say that the, the real question of prayer is not is there anybody on the other end of the line? You know, if you're talking on the phone, there's nobody on the other end of the line, you're crazy. But pr the prayer question is not, is there anybody on the other end of the line? You know, the first book I wrote was a little book I did with, together with Barry Holtz, well-known at JTS, of course, dear friend. And we translated a collection of comments on prayer from the circle of the Baal Shem Tov, whose material I originally studied in Heschel Seminar. And um, my very favorite comment was a one-liner by Rabinchas of Karetz, who says it like this, I'll say it in Hebrew and I'll translate it. He says, People think you pray to God, and that's not the case. But prayer itself is of the divine essence. 
the act of praying is a divine act. You are, you are opening your heart. You are opening your heart and unburdening yourself and going into deeper places. You are, as I said about the Chassid Grand Central, it's not so much as he's saying the words, but is he listening? Is he, is, is, is he listening to the, to the deeper echoes? Is he, is he being present in a special way? Uh, that's all part of the prayer experience. Uh, to me, it's not a question, is there somebody listening? I, I don't know a somebody who's listening. Um, there's a verse, I think it's from the Psalms, we say in, in, in daily tefillah, it says, Vata kadosh yoshev tilot Yisrael. You, Holy One, dwell amid the prayers of Israel. Thy God in, used to be, in the temple, God was Yoshev Akruvim. He used to sit on the cherubim. They were a throne for him. Now the prayers are a throne. You are present in the prayer, in the prayer, not over there somewhere, maybe listening, say, hey, you better say it louder because right? maybe he's sleeping. Uh, it's not like that. So it's a different, it's a different reading of what the experience of prayer is, but it's become, it's become very rich for me and very important. And, and just like the question with the mitzvot, um, I got far beyond the question, well, is there somebody in the sky who said you got to do it? And if there ain't somebody who said you got to do it, why should you do it? It's nonsense. I, I'm far away from that. And so with far away from prayer, I'm prayer, I'm far away from is there somebody listening or not listening? Uh, that's not the question. Are you listening? Um, is, 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 a, is a big part of it. But there is, of course, there is something more than you. Um, because I think that inward journey is ultimately a journey not just to the self, but to self-transcendence. And here we go back to Heschel and Shai Held's wonderful book on Heschel, where he talks about it. Heschel, it's all about transcending the self. Yes, for me, however, it's transcending the self from within. It's the inward journey that goes beyond the self. Um, you know, I talk a lot in my books about the vertical metaphor and the internal metaphor. We Jews are so raised on the vertical metaphor. Where's God? Up there. It's the upstairs, downstairs metaphor. God lives up there. And the journey to God is a journey to the heavens, and you have to climb Jacob's ladder. And I said that you know, since, uh, since the Torah itself, in the verse, Lo Bashamayimi, the Torah is not in heaven, there's also been, a, there's also been an alternative, an inward metaphor. And uh, that's the journey. The journey is a journey inward. And uh, that, but that journey inward is not just to the self, it's not a solipsistic journey. It's a journey inward to the universal self that you discover is present within and, uh, and radiating into the individual self. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of the bekits or nimrats, what my religious life is about these days. So let me follow up with, with two passages from the book that were especially striking to me. On, on page 39, you do a baruch atah, you address, God, I don't want to say God, the one, and you say, quote, I do not believe in you, capital Y, but my life is saved because I do not believe in believing either. I do not believe in you, capital Y. I know you, small y, with no in italics. I don't know that the, the decapitalization of that why was intentional. I think that probably slipped by. I know you should have been also capitalized. But yes, it's da'at. It's da'at. What does da'at Elohim mean? Da'at Elohim. Um, the Rambam, of course, has a very intellectualized form of da'at Elohim. But I've just completed my translation that I worked for on for five years of my very favorite Hasidic classic, uh, Moore Naim. And the Chernobyl Magid there says that uh, the Da'at is the key concept in Moranayim. I just published an article called Da'at in the Moranayim. And um, it's awareness. It's Da'at is awareness. It's awareness of the divine presence that fills the world and fills you. And Dalif Miata Omed, you are standing, or Dabitoch Miata Omed, you are standing before it and within it. And, um, and, uh, and there's also, of course, because this is Hasidism, which was a popular movement, there is the simple, simple knowing of God. Um, simple knowing of God. And, and you remember that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this week's Parsha, in fact, um, that chapter, that second chapter in, in, in Shemot ends with Vayeda Elohim, God knew. 
um, or maybe Israel knew God and just sort of is left, is left hanging there. That's sort of very simple Da'at Elohim, very simple and direct Da'at Elohim is what I'm talking about. Of course, Vayeda, as I say in the next line in the book, I remember the passage well, I say in the next line, Vayeda always contains an echo of the first usage of Yada in the Bible, Vayeda Hadam Yada Chava Ishto, knowing is sexual knowing, knowing that means intimate knowing. So that means Da'at and Yichud are related. Yes, and to know you means I, I enter into you and I become one with you. And that's what mystical Judaism is all about, I think. Yeah. And, and there's another statement you make, which I was personally grateful for. I was looking for it. You talk about the irreducibility of religious experience. So you're not going to allow an anthropologist or a psychologist or a sociologist or a psychiatrist or someone. To one say, of you guys. I'm not going to go one of you guys. That's right. <laughs> you're going to say, so, okay, so we don't believe in the literal truth of this G-O-D figure up there. And yet there is a reality. We are, right? We are transcending ourselves. And this reality is inside of us as well as outside of us. And prayer is somehow this conversation between the divinity outside and the divinity inside something is an event is happening there i think heschel would call it an event right good, good. an event of, an event of the heart yes and, call, call, hashem, call hashem mina shamay in the voice of god from heaven but that heaven in in quotation marks is a heaven that resides in the human heart right. the I, I talk about sinai as a vertical metaphor for an inward experience that's right and you, and you make a move that in the history of like modern Jewish thought, I associate with Franz Rosenzweig, you say, I'm not going to waste time trying to prove this to you. I can't do it. I'm not going to try to do it. I'm witnessing. This is my life. I'm staking my life on this. I'm not going to try to prove to you that I'm that not. Of course, that, of course, is existentialist. That, of course, is Rosenzweig. Yeah. This is my life, right? And there is also Tillich. You remember the distinction between faith and belief. Uh, belief is yeah. belief is kind of my Maimonidean uh, 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 subscribing to certain intellectual principles, whereas faith is really more of a translation of emuna, um, sort of staking your whole life on it. Amen, emuna. It's a shame we don't have a verb that goes with faith. You can't say in English, "I don't just believe it; I say it." You know, <laughs> you want the, you want faith to also have a verb, which is different from believe, and, and the English language just doesn't. The very rich English language just doesn't give us that verb, but that's what you want. Yeah, so Buber has a book called Two Types of Faith, where one type of faith is believe that, and the other one is more like emunai, like trust in. I, I'm staking my life on this. I'm, I'm in relationship, right? And, and belief conjures up a subject-object relationship. I know it. I have to be at a distance from it, right? I hold it in my hand. I grasp it. And that's the opposite of what we're talking about here, right? Exactly. exactly. Emunai vitachon. The faith and trust are really, are, really, are really parallels, of course, yes. Right. So, so we're going to go on in a minute to talk about where this leads in terms of mitzvah, but I have a suspicion that Julia wants to jump in now and do some Q&A. Very good. That's great. Uh, thank you. We definitely have questions. Um, I have a question from Corey, who is asking about prayer in the context of the uh, especially tough times that we're going through, the pandemic, the division in our country, um, and specifically do we pray differently with these kinds of challenges? And if so, how do we pray in a way that's, that's meaningful for, these, for this context? Yes. Uh, somewhere, in my, somewhere in my Sidur commentary on Ashrei, I say, Bechol yom every day, every day, I bless you. I say, every day's prayer is different. Every day's prayer is different. It's shaped, it's shaped by the experience, uh, shaped by the experience of that day. You come in with the same words, uh, but with very different context, because, but very different content, because of the, of the circumstances of your life. So this year has been has been a very tough year, but it affects me. You know, I was saying I was saying all year, Barech aleinu Hashem elokeinu et hashana hazot letova. Bless this year for us for goodness. All my, all, everybody before Rosh Hashanah was saying, Tich leshana v'kilotel. Let this year be over and let's start a new year. And I said no. There must be some blessing to come out of this year. Some kind of blessing is going to come out of this. The fact that the fact that so many of us have learned, indeed, to change our behavior so deeply in the face of something, is this a dress rehearsal for climate change? Is this a dress rehearsal for the ways we're going to have to change our 
behavior in much more serious ways in, in the very near future. Maybe we were, maybe we were given this year to, to learn something from it. I don't know. But, uh, but absolutely, yes, we do pray differently this year. And I feel that this particular week, um, needless to say, dot, dot, dot. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, Anita and Michael, or Anita or Michael, one of them is asking um, if we know or understand God as the, as the totality of evolutionary existence, where do we find the essential ethical obligation to the other, which is the essence of Judaism? Small question. <laughs> yes. Um, because the other is not ultimately other. Um, one of the Hasidic uh, um, Hasidic Musrs forum that I that I that I read recently says, well, well, if you you know, would you would you take your would you take your right hand and 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 break your left arm with it? Would you would you would you do damage to your own self? That's what via hafta l'reacha kamocha means, love your neighbor as yourself. It means not recognizing the neighbor in his ultimate otherness, but recognizing that you and your neighbor are part of the same one. And therefore you have, you have no choice but to, but to live in harmony with your neighbor. You'll never live in harmony with yourself without living harmony with, in harmony with your neighbor because, there, because precisely because there is only one. And so that, uh, there, is a, there is an ethic there is an ethic that emerges from this kind of from this kind of uh, mystical unity of religious thinking, I would say, and uh, and it does have imperatives. Um, I do, uh, you know, in the world of uh, well, well, we'll talk a little more with Arnie about, about mitzvot, but the world of the world of mitzvot ben adam lechavero, that is to say, the world of uh, of interpersonal ethics. I believe there are there are imperatives. And, um, and we very much need them, God knows. And indeed, uh, we see what happens. We see what happens this week when they break down so terribly. Uh, so a related question to what you were just saying is from my, sorry, from my colleague, Moshe Ra'im, um, about the root of evil. If, if uh, there's the right hand and the left hand and they're, they're part of the same, um, where does evil come from in that? And how do we relate to it? They want me to solve everything in two minutes, the problem of evil as well, huh? Um, we are, I'm a monist. That means I believe everything comes from God. And that means evil also. I don't understand it. But I appreciate Kabbalah as a system that is trying to explain the cosmic struggle against evil as the struggle of God, God's self. That God is involved in trying to overcome the roots of evil which exist within the divine self. God is trying to cast them out, to, to, to rise out of them. And we are, being, we are being shown that we must do the same. Uh, that we must enlist ourselves in the struggle against evil. Um, there, is not, there is not an independent divine force that will, that will conquer evil for us. Um, we are part of the great of the great cosmic battle uh, for the forces for the forces of good uh, to subjugate to subjugate evil to good within ourselves, uh, within the world, and um, and that is that is part of the, that is part of our holy work. Um, but yes, I, I I do not I'm not a gnostic. I do not believe in an ultimate duality, uh, God and the devil, or God and the forces of evil. The forces of evil come from within God. As they, as they are present within us, because we are after all in God's image. And, uh, and that means we are all engaged in the same struggle. Can you take uh, one more question about prayer? Sure. Um, so this comes from Mark, who's, who notes that the, the conservative Sidor, or I'll, I'll say the traditional Sidor seems very vertical. Um, and how does one pray to the concept of one? I want to throw just throw in um, the same a version of this question has been um, foremost in my mind as you've been speaking um, as a as a parent. My son is eight years old, and he's he's theologically where I was like in my early twenties. Um, you know, he doesn't he doesn't believe in God the way I did as a child, and I try to talk to him about um, 
all the different ways we can understand the words of the Siddur. And that's uh, that doesn't really translate for an eight-year-old. Um, so I don't know. I think the questions are sort of lifelong. We can reinterpret the Siddur in these conceptual ways, but how do you actually bring that into a prayer experience that's not uh, overly intellectualized? Yeah, overly intellectualized is not where you want to go, especially if you're dealing with an eight-year-old, even a very smart, obviously a very smart eight-year-old. Um, You know, when I, uh, when I was a rabbinical student, I'm picturing myself in the JTS dorm in 1964 or so. I had a neighbor in the room next door named Bert Jacobson, he a rabbi in, in California for many years. And he used to talk, I remember he was as a religious educator, um, he used to teach, uh, teach kids to do nature photography, um, teach kids to develop an eye, an eye for wonder. We were both of course Heschel readers in those days developing an eye for wonder and an eye for an eye for beauty and an eye for the mysterious and uh, and trying to capture that and then show them how how religious language had something to do with that uh, i'm just reading a wonderful book a wonderful book this week I'm reading it for the second time um, called wonder by a fellow named paul fleischman wonder why how and why things appear radiant i think it's called and um, a deeply religious book all about, all about a scientific perception of the universe that ultimately is, uh, is religious, if you know, if you, if you use the term religious broadly. Um, Fleischmann doesn't use the word God at all, but, um, but, 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 it's a, but it's a deeply religious kind of Einsteinian vision of what it means to appreciate the intricacies of, the intricacies of, of what I call creation, what he calls nature. Um, and, and that's just a question of whether you see it with the eyes of wonder or not. So some, some of that, but listen, it's, it's not easy. Uh, the book is very vertical. Indeed, the language of the book is very vertical. So once I discovered that the internal, the inward metaphor works better for our generation than the vertical metaphor, because we're much less hierarchical people. Um, and we don't grow up in, 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 in kingdoms with royal households. And, and if we watch the crown, it's for amusement, but not because we really believe in, 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 in Malchus in that, in, that, in, in that classical sense. Um, and yet I don't want to eliminate all the vertical metaphors. The vertical metaphors are very powerful. And, uh, and they, they're what lend a lot, of, a lot of beauty to the poetry of the tradition. So as long, once, we have, once we have in some ways understood that their metaphor, I say, God bless them, the more metaphor, the better. You know, the Rambam and the Zohar faced the same problem in opposite ways. The Rambam tried to purify, purify our ideas of God, of all imperfections. God is not corporeal and anything anthropomorphic must be denied. And then anything anthropopathic, any human emotions must be denied. And he stripped God naked in a certain way of any kind of language you could, you could use to describe God. The Kabbalists, a century later, century and a half later, came along and said, no, 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 God is a father and God is a king, but God is also a lake and a river and an ocean and a moon and a queen and a, and, and a palace and a throne and a, and, and, and a this and a that. Almost every noun in the Torah, for goodness sake, was used for one of the spherot or another. And it was drowning people in the richness of metaphor, which immediately tells you, oh, they're all metaphors. If they're all metaphors and all symbols, then I can enrich the imagination and the, and, and, and the religious life thrives on the richness of imagination, not on the starkness of denied imagination. So I think that's, I'm looking at my student, Eitan was one of the world's great Zohar experts and talking about the Zohar, but, um, but uh, I think that's part of, the, part of the great richness of that work that it, that it stimulates the imagination. And I'm, I'm all for that stimulation of the imagination, though I understand that's what I'm doing. I understand it's imagination. I understand that imagination plays a great role in my religious life, and I don't run away from that fact. That's why Beautiful. I think. Thank you, uh, 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 Professor Eisen. I'm turning it back to you. We, we could go on with questions forever, but I, I think we want to hear, hear the two of you speak more. That's, what you're just saying is why sometimes I think we should put Shira Kavod. I think we wrote at the beginning of our prayers and not as we often do it at the end to remind ourselves, these are all images. This is a plenitude of wonderful images. We're grasping at something, we're pointing to something that we don't quite get hold of, right? 
it's my favorite it's my favorite text in the whole Sidur, i think because it's so incredibly pagan and um he gives you that apology based on the midrash you know zikna biyomdi in some people on some days they saw you as an elder at some days they saw you as a youth when they needed to see you as a youth they saw you as a youth when they needed to see you as an elder they saw you as an elder i wrote about that many years ago yes indeed wonderful 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 text and so rich in imagination and then and then this kind of love song to the divine head the latter two thirds of the poem are a love song to God's head and crown and hair and uh, just infatuation infatuation with uh, this divine with this divine the, with the beauty of the divine head so I'm going to get to Miss Vaughn now right but but I'm, I'm going to do it with a slight detour that's not a detour, I want to get to it. I'm making a point here that I think you'll agree with it. I want to get to it by way of the chapter about Judaism as a path of love. Good. I want to talk about mitzvah in terms of love. And I just want to tell a story here that my, my JTS colleagues and, and friends may have heard before, which is that my wife Ace and I were on a cruise ship in Alaska a few years ago. It was a very small boat. And we got very friendly with a Presbyterian couple who on the third day at lunch said, do you mind if we ask you a question that we've always wanted to ask our Jewish friends, but I've never had the nerve to ask? And I said, sure, go ahead. And they said, why would you want to worship a God of wrath and judgment instead of the God of love that we worship, right? And I actually was reading a book by a noted anthropologist last week who talks in her own voice about the God of the Old Testament as a tyrant of wrath, as if this is a fact, as opposed to the God of the New Testament, who is the God of love. So. I made a kind of vow at that point that every chance I can, I'm going to stress the fact that Judaism also has a, has a God of love. And I was really pleased to see that you make the bridge between the first and second parts of the book, actually, on this notion of a God of love. So let's, before we talk about commandments, or let's talk about acts of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, um, needless to say, needless to say, we, we all know that there is love, that there is love in the biblical text as well, in the, in, in the Tanakh as well. But this, a, transition, a transition was made. Uh, when Rabbi Akiva says, that loving your neighbor is the, is the, is the, um, is the greatest principle of Torah, uh, that's a century after Jesus said the two commandments that really matter in the Torah are, are uh, uh, loving God and loving your neighbor. And, 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 and Hillel is in there saying the same thing and that there, in other words, there is a shift. Historically, uh, there's an understanding in Jewish pietistic circles in the first and second century, shall we say, that the Torah's real message is a message of love. And one of those pietistic, Jewish pietistic figures happened, happened to become the, the central figure of Christianity. Another Rabbi Akiva, um, I'll, say for, I'll say for Heschel, uh, a new edition of Torah Minash Shamayim was just announced this week, finally. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say for, yes, my dear friend Dror Bundy is just publishing the new edition. I'll say for Heschel that for Rabbi Akiva, um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the very center of Judaism. And um, several people have tried to write on this. Now, um, um, my, uh, no free commercials. My dear friend Michael Fishbane has written a fabulous commentary on the Song of Songs where he talks about the about about love in Judaism and and he's the first modern writer ever to use the fourfold method of scripture pshat remez drashod le pardes in a, in, in a contemporary way it's magnificent but i think too many of the other people who try to write about this subject um, just stick to biblical and rabbinic Judaism they stop after the talmud and that's a mistake i i, I owe so much to the most exciting teacher i ever had in my life and that was Yochanan Mafs in the years before he took ill. And, um, and he has a beautiful book called Love and Joy, but he doesn't know Kabbalah. He would not let himself uh, open the Zohar. He was a bit afraid of Kabbalah. And it's really in the mystical sources where the, where the language of love opens up. And you saw those beautiful passages from Reishi Trochma I quoted and so on, where the love of God is really developed as, a, as the very essence of religion in, in, in mystical Judaism. I mean, in the, the Rambam also has a beautiful passage about loving God. He talks about you, can, you must love God as though you, were, as though you were crazed with love from a woman and couldn't hold back. That's how you should love God. The Rambam will never say that God loves us because love for the Rambam was too much of a human emotion and he couldn't let himself say it. 
So when your Presbyterian friends ask you, I thought you were going to say, do you believe that God loves you? Um, you see, the Rambam was too much of a, too much of a sort of intellectual kamsan uh, in some ways to say, yes, God loves me. He can say, God does, God acts with chesed toward the world, but can't say God loves. But the Zohar, of course, opened that up and it's all, and it's all about love. It's all about this love affair between, between, between God and Israel. Um, uh, um, uh, the Baal Shem Tov is quoted in the Toldot Yaakov Yosef as saying, why do Israel pray and are not redeemed? Because they don't take enough time saying because that's the kissing before you make love. Saying is the kissing before you get to the act of love. And they don't take their time with it. And that's why they're not redeemed. Now that's a person who understood something about love. That's great. <laughs> so I, I, I get from this, and from what you said earlier about the Vyahafta and Vyahafta Lorecha Kamocha, how the relationship with the one would necessarily carry us into imperatives of, of behavior. But now the question is why these particular imperatives? Why is this particular set of imperatives incumbent upon a people that we call Jews? Why, why, why does this notion of God as the one lead Jews to this particular set of obligations and responsibilities? You won't like my answer. I have nothing to offer but love. Uh, that is to say the other, the other reasons why these things become, to use your word, not my word, incumbent, is either because God commanded them or because they're the right way to live, uh, because they make you a better person, thank you, Rambam, or because they have some magical effect on the heavens, thank you, Zohar, um, and all of those are gone. And I think what I have to offer is, this is the religious language I have inherited. I am, I am fortunate enough to be an heir to one of the great spiritual traditions of humanity. And these are the forms, this is the language in which it speaks. And I love it. And I have come to find that this symbolic language is rich and beautiful and works for me. And I'm happy to share that love of this language with you, my students, my rabbinical students, my audience out there in congregation so and so where I where I for so many years spent spent Shabbatot teaching. I'm happy to share that with you, but I do not have a convincing argument that says, ah, you must do this because. Um, I don't have I don't have a must. I have a I have a we are fortunate to have this beautiful religious language and I will talk lots about how powerful it is and how wonderful it is. And, and I've studied, I've spent my life, I have great privilege studying people who were taken to very profound and beautiful inner places by that language. And I, um, and I, like, I, I like to believe that I joined them a bit um, by riding, by riding in the chariot of that language. So I do it. As I say, having resolved a lot of um, overextended adolescent ambivalence over many years. I now do it in a pretty full way. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm deeply rewarded by that. Um, I know that the religious life has ups and downs. Um, you've read my commentary on uh, the Haya Im Shamoa, which I have there in, the, in, in that Baruch Atah chapter, where I talk about that as a, as a spirit, life spiritual journey. If you truly love God with your whole heart and soul, God will give you your wine and your corn and your oil. There are, there are times when the, when the spiritual rewards for living the religious life are very great. Uh, but then there are times when the heaven closes up and there's no rain and you sort of feel spiritually devastated and empty. And every religious person has periods like that in his or her life. That's Abraham walking back and forth to the Negev. Uh, you have moments like that. And what do you do? What do you do in moments like that? That's when you need ritual. You need ritual to hold you together when it's not working well. Because the rituals will bring you back. And I find they have. I find they do. So that's, so that's what I have to offer. I do not have 
a justification. Ah, this is why you must observe mitzvot. You know, I was, um, I was a rabbinical student and I worked in camp. I was the educational director at Ramah in 65, I think, when they, or the year they opened, they opened the, uh, they opened the camp in Palmer and a counselor called me in because he needed me to explain to a kid why he wasn't allowed to practice the violin on Shabbos. He was a serious young violinist, why he wasn't allowed to practice the violin on Shabbos. And that was the last summer I worked for Rama. I couldn't do it anymore because I didn't, I didn't have an explanation for that. I didn't say why you can't do that on Shabbos. I couldn't give him an answer. And I said, this, 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 system, this system is not for me. And that, that was why in the end I chose not to continue identifying with the conservative movement and became a kind of independent Jewish rabbi teacher seeker type because I didn't have a why is, an answer to why is this incumbent. All right, let me sneak in one more question before we go back to Julia. Would your answer be the same if I asked you why I have special attachments and obligations to the Jewish people, to the land of Israel, to the state of Israel, to a minion? What, what, does this follow from the one or is this just because this is what I love? This is what I've discovered that I love. This is what speaks to me. My relationship to the Jewish people in the state of Israel is a whole other topic, uh, but it's not, it's not derivative of a religious imperative in that sense of, of, of the one. I mean, I, I think we relate to we relate to the world in uh, in in concentric circles. We have the little we have our we have our family and we have our chavura and we have our congregation and we have our we have our Jewish people. It's one of those concentric circles, and I I feel very much attached to it, and I feel a great um, a, a great sense of closeness to the Jewish people and caring about the Jewish people's fate. That has everything to do with with our collective history, with my personal history, but that's not the ultimate. That's not the ultimate religious imperative. The ultimate religious imperative for me is universal. Julia? Um, I have questions on a few different topics. One of them is Torah study, which I think we haven't exactly talked about per se. I don't know, Arnie, if you were planning to, to pose a question on that, on that topic or not. Let's go with it. Um, so the question is from Larry, who I guess it's a comment more than a question, but I'm, I'm sure there's what to say. He writes, the more I study Torah, the more I see it as mythic and not actual. It has become really difficult to attend to Torah study when I think we're allowing our critical minds to go on hiatus in order to continue studying. So I, I guess it's something of a parallel question for, um, for learning as some of what we talked about uh, regarding the Sidor, Rabbi Green. Yes, so at, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. Larry, you have to just turn the values around. It's not just historical, it's mythical. That's bigger, that's better. Because it, that means it's addressed to a deeper level of the self and a deeper level of consciousness. That's where myth lives. Myth resides in a kind of place within you where great poetry lives and where great music lives and it, it stirs the soul. And that's why it's so great. And the question of did it historically happen that way? Or was the document actually written that way or when it was written? That's all, that's all footnotes. Um, open you open yourself you open yourself to that myth and let that um, and let that myth stir you and don't be afraid don't be afraid of the fact that it's mythical um, you know engagement with Torah is something I care a great deal about and I run a, a, a you know I, I, I'm a rector of a rabbinical school which I created I created a rabbinical school and it was all based on sharing Ahavat Torah love of Torah is really what I wanted to share with people more than anything a lot of my religious life takes place in the act of learning and teaching, not just in the act of davening and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and observing, observing mitzvot. Um, in Christianity, the two great, the two great elements of, of religion are after all, faith and works. Um, works is mitzvot and faith, right? Faith, 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 faith in Christ, faith and works. In Judaism, it's Torah and mitzvot. For us, it's not about believing and doing mitzvot, it's about learning and doing mitzvot. And we have the wonderful bracha, la'asok b'divrei Torah. La'asok is to be engaged. 
to be engaged. You can be arguing with every single word you see, with every single pasuk, with every single um, with every single commentary, um, but you're engaged. Um, and engaging with Torah, Talmud Torah, is a matter is a matter of deep personal engagement. You think you think it's the effort is still worthwhile. There's more to be dug out of that verse. After I've rejected it on a certain level, after I said no, I don't believe in that. I'm going to go back to it, and I'm going to maybe I'm going to count up the letters and make a gematria. Maybe I'm going to maybe I'm going to see a new grammatical insight. Maybe I'm going to pick up some safer that has read it in a different way and and go to Torah Shlema and find all the midrashim and and so on. And something something new and exciting can still happen there. That's the act of faith. That something new and exciting can still happen in that ongoing project of Talmud Torah. And that's uh, when I say, I say in the morning, I don't say Shalom Asani Goy in the morning, I say Shalom Asani Yisrael. When I say Shalom Asani Yisrael, that's one of the things I mean, that who, who planted me, I thank God for having planted me into this tradition that has that, that has that, that active sense of engagement and there's always, there's always more to be found. So, uh, so don't give up on it. Thank you. Um, a totally different topic. Um, all right, I want to pose two questions together. The first is from Avi, who writes, um, Tillich, mentioned before, encouraged his readers not to look away from despair. The path to the courage to be, for him, was through despair, not around it. Do you relate to this kind of thinking? And he notes that you're an author of a book on Rabbi Nachman. <laughs> yes, of course. And I'm, then let me, let me let me. I put that together. You look for that. You have that from Breslau. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> right. Um, then a, a question that I that um, I want to put together with that is from Epi, who writes, um, "Could your sense of the divine have therapeutic possibilities?" So we can uh, put those together if if that's okay with you. Well, yes. Um, I spent years, of course, working on Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. Um, I wrote that biography when I was quite young. I was in my I was in my early thirties when I completed it. It's now um, the Hebrew the Hebrew version of Tormented Master was a bestseller in Israel for many years. I'm delighted to say it's coming out next year in a revised version. The text is the same, but I've had a, we've had a graduate student in Israel updating the footnotes over the 45 years since it was first written. Um, so I have a, I have an ongoing relationship with Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, of course. But I I I you know I met Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. I knew I could not be a wrestler for Chassid, but I wanted to have an intimate relationship with that man, so I became his biographer. And biographer is a, biography is a kind of intimacy where you, uh, where you have a certain kind of give and take. But of course, Reb Nachman is speaking, to, is speaking to people who have been through despair. Um, and the, the, theory, the theory of wrestler Chassidism is, it's all right, anything, any despair, any loneliness, any emptiness, any doubt, that you're going through, don't worry, the Rebbe has been through that and worse and has overcome it and he can help you do the same. And that's a very powerful message. And I think that's why that's why Breslov has shocked everybody. When I started studying Rabbi Nachman, my goodness, there were a few hundred families of Breslov and Hasidim in the world. And uh, since the 1980s, of course, it's been, it's been expanded and rediscovered and, and 30,000 people go to Uman and uh, and, uh, but I spent much of my life away from Reb Nachman because that preoccupation with constantly having to struggle against despair, I found was itself an unhealthy preoccupation. If you have to work so hard constantly to fight off despair, it means you're, it means that's where you live. And that's who Reb Nachman was. He was a person who, who, who lived with a great deal of, a great deal of depression and was working, was working constantly to stave it off and to transform it. And that's a, it, the account of his journey to do that is beautiful, but I wanted a healthier Hasidism in some ways as the model for my own neo-Hasidic philosophy. So I went back to the Baal Shem Tov and the Chernobler, where there's a much more healthy, this worldly, less despairing kind of view of Hasidism. Uh, and yes, yes, it's all about, it's all about the therapeutic. It's no accident that Buber's tells of the Hasidim is a favorite of a great many Jewish psychoanalysts and, uh, and made its way into the Fritz Perl's world and so on. And, um, and, 
And there is, uh, there is certainly a therapeutic value to all this, but I always say that's not what it's about. Avedis Hashem, service of God, which is a, an important phrase in my life, service of God as I understand it, is not the same as meditation is good for you. It's about, oh, trans- yeah. it's about transcending the self, not, not just healing or serving the self. So I just want to piggyback a little bit on what Art just said to say, to, to my mind, the single most beautiful chapter in this book, which has a lot of beautiful pages in it, is the one called um, Jewish mysticism and its healing power. Mm-hmm. And in that chapter, Art directly addresses the relationship between this particular tradition and the, and the work of healing. And particularly, you, you talk about the fact your own woundedness, woundedness after the death of your mother, as one of the things that connected you to Rav Nachman and, and to Kathy, who had lost her parents. And you talk about yourself as having been brokenhearted for a very long time and how, and how Judaism helps you deal with brokenheartedness. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful section. And I wonder if you're willing to share a little bit of that with the, with our- well, you, you, you already have. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, there's no question that I was attracted to writing a book on Reb Nachman of Raslav because I was a person who'd been through a, a, a difficult and complicated spiritual journey. And I felt he was, I felt he was someone who understood me. And uh, sometimes I feel he understands me. He, I mean, the, the he, I reconstruct out of the, out of the pages of Likute Moran, obviously. Um, sometimes I feel he understands me better than a lot of, uh, a lot of contemporary, a lot of contemporary therapy would. Um, uh, there were times in writing the biography of Rabbi Nachman of Braslav, this will, this will be an answer for you. In the, while writing the biography of Rabbi Nachman, there were times when I felt that he was really a presence in my life. And as I struggled over a difficult passage in, in his teachings, I was, uh, and I had an insight, I would say, oh, he's letting me in, he's letting me, he's helping me understand, he's there and he's helping me understand, he's helping me understand the book because he wants, he want, he, he, he wants me to have that breakthrough. And then I said, of course, because as long as I'm working on him, he's got a chance to work on me. And, uh, and that mutuality of relationship between subject and biographer, um, he was working on me the whole time I was working on him. But I might say the same thing about the relationship between God and the person. You know, um, Zeitlin already said, um, uh, God creates us in the divine image and we are obliged to return the favor. And we have a, really two chapters about a mitzvah that you single out for special attention. You might call it the, the broken world right now. And, and the imperative that we do stuff to heal this planet of ours, to save this planet of ours from destruction. So it's broken hearted human beings responding to a broken world of creation with an imperative to not only heal themselves, but, but heal the world. Yeah. A broken world, and look, we look, we live in a broken country. In case you hadn't noticed, we live in a broken, we live in a broken country. Um, that brokenness, that brokenness, is very much there. And I think the in all the imagery of Gullus, all the imagery of, of of exile that's in Judaism, I think ultimately it's it's the exile, not just the exile of Jews from Eretz Yisrael, but it's the exile of humanity from Eden. Um, and uh, and there is we have a we have a faint memory of an Edenic world somehow, um, from which we have from which we have been expelled or expelled ourselves, walked away from it. But uh, but you have that wonderful that wonderful midrash in Kohelet Rabbah where where God walks Adam Arishon, God walks Adam around the garden and says, "Look at this garden. There's nobody. If you destroy it, there's nobody who will come to replace it to to repair it after you." And uh, how could they? How could they in the uh, whatever in the seventh or eighth or tenth century said said such a thing that was quite so prescient as uh, as it would be for our generation. So uh, so I think there I think there are gems in the tradition that were put there for our generation. You know when the rabbi said said luchot v'shivrei luchot munachim hayu ba'aron 
that both the whole tablets and the broken tablets were placed in the ark. Of course, the broken tablets were placed there for a generation like ours that can no longer learn from whole tablets. All we have are fragments that we have to piece together. Um, and each of us puts the puzzle together in our own way. That's what the broken tablets are for, for a broken generation. But we do have tablets that work for a broken generation. So yes, I believe, I really believe that, um, that uh, caring for this, caring for this beloved planet of gods is, um, is, uh, is, is right up there at the top of uh, the list of mitzvot. And I've become quite an activist on, 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 on climate change. If you want to know the one mitzvah, the one minhag I have added to the, to the, to the, to the religious lives of all my students, um, we at Hebrew College every day conclude our davening with the ma'amad for that day. And that means the day in the, in the tale of creation in Breshit Aleph. On Sunday, we conclude the davening with Breshit Bara Elohim. On Monday, this morning, we can, I, I, I said, Vayom Elohim Hirakia. Tomorrow it'll be Kavu Hamayim. We tell the tale of each day so that you complete the cycle of creation uh, by when you get to Shabbos. And that's, that's done. I've instituted that for, for sort of my broad community of followers and disciples and, and, and friends uh, as a reminder that uh, we live in a created world. And creation is our, is, 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 is the language of creation is the language to remind us of responsibility for this world. And that means planting trees, among many other things, and lots of other, lots of other good things that we need to do to uh, uh, to engage, to engage in that in that in that struggle for survival of this planet. And that means it means political action. It means it's one area where we must work with others, where we must work together with uh, uh, with, with, with with Christians and Muslims and others who are seeing this, because we are on that side really a tiny, tiny part of the human race. But uh, one of my dear students is conducting a big Jewish climate festival toward the end of this month. If you want to hear me again, you can hear me at the Jewish climate festival talking about this issue war. I give him, I give him a free plug. Julia? Um, one, one theme that's come up in a handful of questions that I don't, I don't know if we've addressed it explicitly is, uh, is community in a variety of ways. Um, we've talked a lot about the self and, and God and, and now the planet. Um, we talked a little bit about the other, but um, Rabbi Green, is that something that you want to um, share any thoughts about, about the community? I'm still a Chavaraju. Um, you know, it works best. Judaism was made for community. And for me, Chavara means, means small, intimate community of people who are, of people who are, uh, able to share and support one another's spiritual journeys and religious lives. Um, I've now heard that the Greenspoon Foundation, which is very active here in Massachusetts, has been working to set up Chavurot all over Western Mass. And I think it's a wonderful thing. We, we in the Chavura era, you know, our Chavura began in 1968, and I was there for five years, and my Chaverim from those years are still among my very dearest and closest friends. But we were, we were, we were purists. It was 19, we were 1968 purists. And we didn't say, let's find a way to create Chavurot all over the country and change, transform the Jewish world with Chavurot. Some of it happened and some of it was our influence. And I think we did have some influence on Jewish life. Even my, 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 my dear friend Arnie grew up in the, in the Chavura, Chavura influence world, of course. When I, looked at, when I looked at you at JTS and David Ellison at HUC, I said, oh, I guess. I guess the Chavurot have really taken over the world. Um, but uh, I continue to believe in Chavura, which is to say a small community, a community that will be, each Chavura has to decide what it needs to be, a community of learning, a community of doing Shabbos together, a community of celebration together, a community of mutual support. And then a network of Chavurot becomes a congregation, but a congregation should be made up of Chavurot where people have a chance for, for a closer and more and more intimate kind of Jewish experience. I think people like, like uh, uh, Harold Schulweis and Dov Peretz Elkins who are organizing Chavurot within their congregations uh, 50 years ago were doing the right thing. And, um, and I think it's a movement that's going to come back actually. 
Um, so I think religious community, listen, one of the, one of the few things, uh, concrete things that we synagogues and churches still have to offer in this world of alienation and, uh, and, and compartmentalization is authentic human community. Um, there still is something about the guys you daven with, I say guys in the broad sense, in the inclusive sense, people you daven with, um, that, 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 that feels like a real community. Now, something has happened to us this year, uh, and that is Zoom. Here we are. And the question is, can we have intimate community on Zoom? And will Zoom communities replace real in the flesh communities? If you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said, oh, no, I'm completely against that. One of the things we have to offer is real live community. I can't wait till we're finished with this so we can get back to a community where you can hug people. Um, what is it? You remember that word hug, H-U-G, something we used to do all the time, hugging our friends? Uh, for those of us who live alone through this year, that's, 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 that's a distant memory at this point. And uh, I care an awful lot about the physical side of that kind of intimacy and community. But I'm also noticing that I can teach a little study group of people who really want to study a particular thing and, and love that experience. And some of them are in Jerusalem and some of them are in California and some of them are here on the East Coast. And we can do it together over Zoom and maybe that will change the nature of community for us to some degree. So, uh, so I think this is, a, this is an age when we have to hold on to the values of real intimate community, but also with a certain openness, with our eyes open to saying what is lost and what is gained uh, in, this, uh, in this community across the screen. I think, um, yeah, m much is gained and also much is lost. I think, I think um, shul goers have um, developed all kinds of appreciation for shul that they may have taken for granted before. I can say so personally anyway. I want to just push you a little bit on the community question um, just about, about the Jewish community more broadly. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's so many... There's so many factions and divisions in the Jewish community, and uh, just in the past week, I feel like that's been particularly present um, you know, on social media. I, do, you, do you have any um, guidance or perhaps comforting words on that on that score? Um, we stand for something. We stand for something. Jews are still a distinct group in this society. Uh, we are still different, but we have to be different, not just different from, but different, different representing something. And we represent values of decency and honesty. We represent Selim Elohim with the value of the value of the value of, of, of considering every human being to be a unique image of God. Um, we represent a people who still remember that we were slaves in Egypt and our big celebration of the year is still liberation from bondage. And that means we sympathize with other people who have been in bondage and are still struggling with their liberation. Um, I am terribly, terribly distressed when I hear that rabbis, even in conservative congregations, let alone Orthodox, cannot stand up and speak out against the awful things that this man in the White House has been doing for the last four years, you cannot you cannot speak about Trump because that's because that's being too political, and I say that's an outrage in our Jewish community. It's an outrage. I read somebody sent me a piece today about the Orthodox community in support of Trump and what a terrible mistake it was, and it was all about how it was strategically bad, because it will cost them next time they want a favor, and I was outraged. And where's the moral voice? Do we have no more moral voice? Does Judaism not stand for honesty and not stand for integrity and not stand for human decency? And where have we where 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 have we been and how and how have we how have we dared allow ourselves not to become an important moral voice in the society? If it divides us, all right, it divides us. But I think I think I think I think that 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 that, that we know we know who we are, um, and that means in this society, by the way since I think we want to continue surviving in this society as a minority group, um, our place is with minorities. 
our place is with a vision of a diverse, multi-ethnic and, and, and multifaceted America. And I know we were given the great bracha of being accepted as white after a long delay in the 1960s, 1970s. And we love all the privilege that comes with it. Um, but ultimately we are a minority group and a vulnerable minority group. And it's time in this, in this moment to realize who we are. So that there were, that there were, um, that there were, um, uh, Bnei Israel from our brethren in the House of Israel in that mob last week is uh, is deeply unnerving and upsetting to me. Thanks for addressing that. So um, we're about out of time. So let's shift from that um, sad space um, to see if there's anything anything that we didn't touch on that that to you um, is kind of the reason you needed to write this book that you want to share with us before we close tonight. Well, I think we did a pretty good job, first of all. Thanks, many thanks to both of you. I think it was wonderful. Um, this book is a book of essays because I said to myself, the habit of reading is declining in our society. People are, don't have the patience anymore to read whole books. So let's give them a book where they can read a chapter. If they like it, they'll read another chapter. They can pick it up and put it down. There's a section of chapters on the, on the cycle of the holidays which you can read across your, your Shabbos or Yontif table to get, your, to get your teenagers talking about something or something like that. It's not meant to be read in one go. But I'm worried, I'm worried about the act of reading. I'm worried that we are losing, we are losing. I've spent my life writing books. Um, Hebrew College is now planning to move to a new location in a couple of years and we will have to downsize our library. And so I stand before walls of books in the library with a kind of, I have red stickers in my hand and green stickers in my hand, and it's a kind of and I look at all these writers who wrote these books over the years, and I say, nobody's going to read that in our library anymore. No, but that's not a book we need to keep, and it kind of breaks my heart. So, uh, so, uh, so keep reading, keep learning, uh, uh, keep, uh, keep, uh, uh, keep immersing ourselves in the in the great in the great in the great tradition of. Uh, of, of, of Judaism and our and our and our, and our love of uh, of both Torah Shibichtav and Torah Shibal Peh, both the both the written word and the and the and the oral conversation. That's who we are. I want to say what one last word. Near the end of the book, Art, you write the following sentence: "Quote this enterprise, to which I feel so committed, building a bridge between the memory of Hasidism." and the needs of countless Jewish seekers in our own time, how few have walked across it. And I just wanted to say a personal thank you as a, as a friend and a fellow student of Jewish thought. Thank you for walking across it all these years and, and, and taking us across it with you. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful to be with you all. Lala Tov. Thank you so much, Rabbi Green, uh, for sharing this this um, life's worth of accumulated wisdom with us, sort of encapsulated in an hour and a half. Um, thank you, Professor Eisen, for for giving shape to the conversation and drawing out these beautiful points from the book. Um, and thank go you, get to everybody. The book. everybody, go get the Absolutely book. Absolutely, get the book. We put the the link to the um, Yale University Press uh, page in the chat, and of course, you can get it um, from online booksellers. Um, so thank you so much to both of you. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry we only got to, um, to a handful of them. We have uh, so much online learning going on at JTS. So um, check out our website. We have uh, lectures every week and we look forward to seeing you all again soon at JTS. Uh, thanks again to everyone. Have a wonderful night. Great.